Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hey, hello, and welcome to Stan Energy Man. I'm Stan Osterman from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies. And under the category of better late than never, I closed last week's show without wishing everybody a happy Memorial Day weekend. And thanks to all the military folks out there that served, especially ones that uh, didn't make it back and gave us all the freedoms that we have and we get to enjoy. So thanks for uh, all that you guys do and your families. And welcome to Stan Energy Man. Uh, my, my guest today is Mitch Ewan from the University of Hawaii, HNEI. Mitch, welcome. I know you've hey, thanks, been Dad. on before, and, yeah. uh, and I appreciate you coming on. But um, we, we're, we kind of go way back. In fact, you go way back farther in hydrogen than me, but uh, sure. so you're the real expert. But um, let's talk a little bit about Big Island. That's what the, the show's about today is what you're doing on right. the Big Island. But let's, let's go back to early Big Island when you originally started your stations. They were going to be at Puna Geothermal. So let's just kind of talk a little bit about what's going on in the Big Island for folks that don't know much of the geography of Hawaii or, right. or anything. And, you know, people have, have been calling us and saying, are you guys okay? Are you guys okay? Well, yeah, we're like 300 miles away right, from the exactly. volcano, so yeah. Yeah. it's no big deal. But <clears throat> tell us a little bit about what, what Puna meant to you when you started looking at uh, building, doing hydrogen out there. Yes, uh, well, when we started the project originally, uh, we were going to supply hydrogen to the Volcano National Park. And we were lucky enough to team up with Puna Geothermal, who gave us a deal on you know, space and electricity mm -hmm. and water and all that sort of thing. So we planned to put our hydrogen facility right at the Puna Geothermal plant. And so we went through about four years of site evaluation, environmental uh, assessments. assessments, and all that kind of stuff, and got to the point where we're about to close on all those deals when in 2014, they had the original um, lava flow, which came within like a few hundred yards of the uh, main road. So we're pretty concerned that, you know, $7 million worth of equipment was going to get stranded there. And not only that, how would we deliver the hydrogen from there? If you cut off the road. Yeah, if they cut off the road, we would have been, you know, a project without a, you know, without yeah. a customer. So we made the uh, command decision, as I call it, my ex-military training, we made the command decision to shift to the west side in Kona at Nelha. And in hindsight, I guess it looks like a, a brilliant decision, but uh, you know, who would have thought that you know, we'd have an eruption like we're having now, and it's a real tragedy. Um, it looks like the plant didn't get hit too hard, and I know from talking to uh, the plant uh, way back in the day that they actually planned for having an eruption and being inundated by lava. So they, they planned how they Would built their wells, yeah. how they mitigated yeah. it. And so fingers crossed that uh, that works and that they'll be able to resurrect the well after yeah. all this eventually passes, whenever that is. Okay. So. Yeah, there's kind of a, not a big controversy. But a lot of folks are wondering whether this means the end of geothermal in Hawaii or the beginning of geothermal in Hawaii, because there's an awful lot of energy flowing out of the ground over there and we're just letting it flow down the hill and into the ocean when we could be turning a lot of it into electricity, steam, and other, other great things. Well, it's a significant impact on our renewable energy targets as well. I mean, they provide about 25% of the uh, Big, Island's power. Big Island yeah. power, and that's a significant part of their yeah. renewable energy quota that they have. Yeah. And, so. they're, and they could be providing 100% easily. Oh, yeah. yeah. They think it's a huge resource. Yeah. We're, we're kind of looking, we're hoping that geothermal is still alive on Maui and the Big Island and maybe even Oahu because um, as a baseline power, baseload power, that's perfect for here. And, and we can generate a lot of power from that. So yeah, it's perfect. Nice we can do it. Sorry. It's perfect for hydrogen, too, having that baseload 24-7 yeah. steady yeah. state power. That's yeah. exactly what we need for the hydrogen economy. Okay. Well, speaking of hydrogen... Now that you've made the command decision to move to Kona with your station, yeah. and it's been a while in the works, but it looks like you're on the on the one yard line and getting ready to push into the goalpost. So, yeah. tell us about what you're doing out there. Well, it's been a long haul. Um, first of all, um, we uh, we relocated to the uh, Nelha site, which is uh, you know basically a, a sub agency of the of DBED, so it's mm -hmm. actually a state property. And so that helped us out a lot. They have pre-existing uh, EISs and uh, EAs mm -hmm. in place, so we didn't have to go through all that. Um, 
And so then we had just had to come up with a new design. So we came up with several iterations. Um, we actually, you know, uh, looked at three separate sites at Nelha, and eventually we're located in what they call the uh, research park right down at the bottom of the road. Okay. And um, right opposite the main administration building. Mm -hmm. So it's a really good site for us. Mm -hmm. uh, they have existing infrastructure in place, so that helped us reduce our costs. Mm -hmm. But we put in a significant infrastructure there. I gotta say that Nelha has been a great landlord. In fact, they took over the project management of actually uh, putting in the uh, infrastructure at the site. Mm -hmm. So we basically subcontracted Nelha to do the job, and they have an excellent Project manager Al Alex uh, Leonard, who mm -hmm. was with Nan Construction, was a senior guy, so he knows all about all about construction and how to get things done. So it's, well, I've been it's trying really to get good. Greg Barber on the show, but he's been so busy helping you with yeah. your station, I can't get him on the show. But and we can bring up that first photo of the station yeah. and, and get a look at it. But um, and to give people an orientation, this is kind of south uh, west of the airport proper in Kona. So Nelha is the Natural Energy Laboratory for Hawaii. And it's a it's a big compound that um, that they do like um, like like Mitch says it's kind of like an economic zone where there's lobster farmers there's uh, fish fish farmers there's um, water bottlers that pull deep water up and and right. purify it and export it there's it's there's a lot of business going on down there and, right. and more room to do more exactly. and that's where you're at so. In fact, the water bottling plant, I'm not sure of this year, but they were the biggest exporter of goods uh, out of Hawaii for yeah. many, several years. Yeah, and I think they're, they're expanding too. Right. Well, let's pull that picture back up and yeah. get a quick look at that station, and you can describe to folks what, what we're looking at. Yeah, so um, looking at the, from this view, behind me would be the administration buildings and uh, uh, that set up there. Um, so, what you see here is the entrance uh, to the hydrogen station, um, and to the right is the dispenser, which looks just like a gasoline dispenser you see at a normal gas station, and we'll have close-up views of that. You'll see a 40-foot shipping container just over the top of the, fan, uh, the, the sign, and that contains all the major equipment, electrolyzer to make the hydrogen, a huge compressor to compress it, and then a, uh, an electrical room that distributes the energy. We get the energy for the station from the grid. Um, the grid uh, before the geothermal event uh, was about 83% uh, uh, renewable energy during the day, like on a good sunny right. day. It drops down to about 50, 53% at night. So basically our hydrogen was actually, you know, had a high component of renewable energy uh, in it. So. Okay. So if you want to go back to the, the drawing, the rendering. The second image. The okay. second image, the 3D rendering. There you go. So there's a layout, um, top view, bottom view. Uh, I'll go to the bottom uh, picture. Uh, you see the 40-foot shipping container kind of in the middle, and on the left is the dispenser, and you see a Helion rendering of a Helion bus. Uh, that's part of the project. We, we funded uh, the uh, purchase of and conversion of uh, a 29-passenger uh, shuttle bus for the Helion bus service. And then on the right, uh, you see a bunch of canopies and what look like horse trailers. Those are uh, hydrogen tube trailers that we use for transporting hydrogen from Nelha to Volcano National Park, where we will be putting in a second dispenser. That'll bring us up to three dispensers on the Big Island once right. we're through with that. So just to orient people, the Helion bus is actually part of the, the county's bus service to get employees around the island between Hilo and Kona, but this particular shuttle bus will be operating primarily, as I understand it, between the Kona airport and Kona town proper Correct. Uh, to help move uh, employees to the airport for their work, and it'll be hydrogen powered all the way. And then the two, the two uh, tube trailers you see on the left of the top image there, those are going to be going and servicing Volcano National Park. And that's, that's quite a haul, though, from going from the Puna Geothermal, where it was originally planned, yeah. to hauling those all the way up to the top of the mountain. But the, the main thing is, if that's your only source of hydrogen, then, then you got to do what you got to do. Right. But we want to show the technology, and, and um, we'll talk about those buses a little later in the show. Right. But um, it's, uh, it's... I wanted to point out another thing, and you can go back to either one of those images, um, Robert, but... 
Um, one thing that I wanted to explain to people is when, when we first started looking at building hydrogen stations for the military here, we had these big blast walls up and all kinds of uh, mitigation equipment. But you know, you've gone through the county and the and the and the building permit process and right. and all that. I noticed that there were there were there were fire sensors or heat sensors in there. Um, but is there any suppression? And I, I don't see any blast walls. So that's code now. Uh, your your yes, stuff is uh, code. So basically, um, the 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 main design element on the hydrogen safety part is to have setback distances from your actual hazardous area, which is basically the vents on the top of the stack. Right. So you allow a certain distance between all that. So for example, you go back to that, uh, that the, the rendering. rendering. So that, there's a wall there right at the front of the picture, and that's our electrical panel wall. So we had to move that around slightly to make sure that we fit within okay. our setback distances. That's the wall in the lower picture. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, and all the electrical equipment is on the outboard side right. rather than the inboard side. So. Okay. So yes, all the um, all the setback distances, and we brought in a consultant from the mainland to evaluate our, you know, do a safety analysis of yep. it, and we work closely with the uh, planning department. Uh, this is the first one they've ever done, right? and so they had a lot to learn. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the codes and standards for hydrogen is a pretty thick book, and you know, it's a lot of heavy duty reading. Yeah. And so um, it took us a fair bit of time to put this together, but of course, we're the scouts out in front of the wagon train. Now the people following us, mm -hmm. after, now that we've done the basic work that the, the planning department has become more familiar with hydrogen, the fire department is familiar with hydrogen, it should be easier for the next person coming along with a hydrogen station to get their permitting right. in place. And that's, and that's what the university does. We're there to blaze a path, find out what all the problems are, come up with solutions, and help educate and uh, provide outreach to the local authorities having jurisdiction on what it takes to put in this in place. Right. And that's all part of this project. So you did that on the Big Island, and Surfco is doing that over here on, in Mapuna Puna with their station. Correct. With the Oahu folks. But, you know, one thing I want to point out to, to the viewers, you know, when we start doing these stations, and you saw the image there, that's about the size of a regular gas station. And you could have three or four more dispensers and really right. wouldn't be adding a whole lot to that. But what you're really looking at is an oil field, an oil pipeline, an oil tanker ship, a whole big refinery, and the delivery trucks to deliver gasoline all in one place with one 40-foot container and some dispensing equipment. So you're looking at the entire energy system that it takes to make the hydrogen all in the footprint of a gas station, and you're missing all that other infrastructure, all those chances to spill oil, right. all those chances to contaminate environment, all those chances to mess things up, and all the transportation costs. So when you start really looking at, does this pencil out? Well, if you just took the transportation costs of gasoline alone, it, it definitely pencils out. You sure. just got to get your power cheap enough to make it worthwhile. And uh, I know that with wind power on the mainland going for four to seven cents a kilowatt hour, that's, that's cheaper than buying gas once you put it in a system like this. Yeah, exactly. Actually, so, it's cheaper. It's around two and yeah. a half cents a kilowatt hour. Yeah, it, it can get down really low. So it's like... So if you dedicated renewable energy to hydrogen production and, and just said, well, we're going to amortize this over so many years and write it off yeah. and didn't have transmission lines and transformers and everything else that the utilities have to do, you could be producing hydrogen pretty darn cheap and store yeah. that energy and using it whenever you want yeah, exactly. in stationary fuel cells. So something important to look at when you're doing, looking at a station like that. We've got a couple more images uh, that show more of the details of the station. So Robert, why don't you throw those up and we'll talk to them as they go through. Pretty close. Okay, those are, those are? Yeah, so um, that's uh, the, the entrance to the main gate, and what we're looking at are those fueling posts that Stan talked about earlier. They're an interface between the electrolyzer and our hydrogen tube trailers. We have a space for two hydrogen tube trailers that would back into there, and they would connect up to those posts and be charged up with, with hydrogen. And there, there's a close-up close view of it, and you can see the crash barriers, that's to you know, guide the, help guide the trailer, make sure we don't run into one uh, of those uh, fueling posts. Good idea. Uh, what you don't see there is all the underground work. So these are all interconnected by uh, tubes and uh, electrical uh, wires and sensors and all that, because this station 
is totally automated, it's remotely monitored, and it's designed for unattended operation Great. so that the driver of the bus can drive in self -service. there. Self-service. just like your self-service gas yeah. station. So it was a big, a large amount of construction that was done by NAN Construction. Who and the pad is, is uh, grounded as well, right? Just oh, it's got more remar than you would ever want to think yeah. about. Everything is grounded. Some of the uh, later pictures I'll show you, even the barbed wire, the individual strands are all grounded. grounded. Right, good. So. And there's some more close-ups of some of the uh, dispensing equipment here. That's what that's where the bus would actually fill up then, right? Or car yeah. if they want to bring a yeah, car. Yeah, exactly. In. So that's like a normal. It looks exactly like a normal uh, gasoline dispenser you'd see at a normal gas station. And uh, the, the the actual operation is the same. It has a hose with a nozzle. And the only difference is that you have a a gas tight lock between the dispenser and the vehicle through mm -hmm. your nozzle. And then you hook on. And then the dispenser is totally computer controlled. Uh, you don't have to sit there with a trigger and operate it. The, the dispenser does all that. And, and doesn't the dispenser talk to the vehicle electronically? Yes, it does. There's, it there's, measures the temperature of the tank and everything. And keep the it pressure, and, pressure and, all yeah. that, so. and so it's it's pretty sophisticated, but it's it's user friendly. Yes. Really user friendly. Yeah, exactly. Well, we we tried to take the man out of the loop as much as possible. So okay. we try to think of all these things. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break here and uh, talk about some other shows here on ThinkTech, and then we'll be back with Mitch Ewan to talk a little bit more about uh, the station and the vehicles. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, your host on ThinkTech's Likeable Science Show. Every Friday at 2 p.m., we delve in the magical, <laughs> magical, fascinating world of science, how science applies to your life, why you should care about science, what impact science has on you and on those around you, why you need to know some science. It's a fun, interesting, painless way to learn some good science that you can use. See you there. Hi, I'm Pete McGuinness-Mark, and every Monday at one o'clock, I'm the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. And at that program, we bring to you a whole range of new scientific results from the university, ranging from everything from exploring the solar system to looking at the Earth from space, going underwater, talking about earthquakes and volcanoes, and other things which have a direct relevance not only to Hawaii, but also to our economy. So please try and join me, one o'clock on a Monday afternoon to Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa, and see you then. Hey, welcome back to Stan the Energy Man on my lunch hour. That's really important because I'm a state employee. I'm here on my lunch hour. <laughs> so uh, we've got Mitch in here, and we're talking hydrogen stations. Uh, the first hydrogen station on the Big Island outside of Blue Planet's uh, ranch up in Pu'uva'a. And we're hoping that now that the stations are there, the vehicles will follow, and, I, and they will. Mitch has made sure of that uh, right off the bat. But um, when we're talking about the stations, one of the other things about the dispensing is that's not just the kind of a, you invented that dispenser. It's standard, right? There's a there's yeah. an international standard for those. Oh yeah, they, they, there's a, there's codes for the uh, the actual dispenser. All the yeah. systems there they have codes and standards that the the manufacturer follows. Yeah, so and all the all the vehicles that are being built are being built to either be fueled to 5,000 psi or 10,000 psi Correct. currently, and there's actually two separate kind of nozzles to fill the two separate kind of vehicles, so you don't put high pressure into a low pressure vehicle. Yeah, that's correct. So. Your station is geared up for both, or just one? Or? <clears throat> no, our station is geared up for 5,000 psi, okay. which is what heavy-duty heavy heavy vehicles uh -huh. like buses and trucks fill up on that. Great. It's because they have the real estate, i.e. the space available to store hydrogen tanks, whereas a light-duty vehicle like a car has very limited right. space, and so that's why they go to the higher pressure. Right, okay. Right. Yeah, but it's important. it was important. This is... People think hydrogen is such new technology that, that we're like breaking ground here, but right. hydrogen has been around a long time. There's a lot of research done on it. There's been a lot of standardization done via California sure. and the Northeast states and Europe and Japan and, and Korea. And, you know, this has been well thought out, well orchestrated, especially by, by uh, California. And um, mm -hmm. we're just basically plagiarizing everything we can from California. Thank you to Tyson and those guys in California. <laughs> um, and doing what we can to, to get Hawaii accelerated. And I think the Big Island is gonna be the one taken off here real quick. I think so. Especially the fact that we have, we'll have actual hydrogen buses which allows the general public to actually experience 
a hydrogen vehicle, which if you just have light duty cars, unless you have a friend who has one, you wouldn't have, you'd be able to do that. Right. Whereas anybody can get on the bus and go for a ride, whether it's the Helion bus or the two hydrogen buses we'll have up at Volcano National Park. Okay. Well, is so, anything else about the station we forgot to talk about? Otherwise, we'll move into the buses and start, start looking at them and you can explain. Uh, yeah, right. sure. Okay. Yeah. So, Robert, why don't you bring up one of the bus pictures and we'll talk about what's uh, going on with the buses. Oh, we did. This is more of the station. Yeah. This is the electric work. Thing to point out on this is it's all stainless steel. Because right. if you notice the ocean in the background. Yeah. I'd like <clears> to point out that that stainless steel is already starting to corrode. So yeah, it does. We've got to go and wire brush it down yeah. and put some wax or something on it. Good news for you. Keep stainless steel good. still has steel in it. Yeah. So right. It's kind of. Yeah, it's get unbelievable. The, get the unbelievable. So, oh, okay. those are two of my guys, uh, Gunter and uh, Aaron, who are uh, working on that dispenser and hooking up the various sensors and making sure it all works. So I wanted to get a plug for the guys. Yeah. So it was a I hot day, a too. So, hey, there's the Helion bus in Torrance, California. Right. So um, this is a uh, El Dorado um, cutaway bus, a 29 passenger bus in this case, uh, fully ADA compliant. We have uh, space for two wheelchairs. Uh, and a lift. Um, I also like to point out that we are uh, we we developed uh, are developing an export power unit with our our partner U.S. Hybrid, who is here in Hawaii ex right. as well, to put in a uh, 10 kilowatt power export unit so that you can export you know you can, so you can use the bus as a portable generator. Generator. Yeah. You, you know. So for example, if you had an eruption that wiped out a certain part of your infrastructure and you need you had some critical loads like refrigeration at a drugstore to keep your or drugs. Or you had a command post. Or a command up. post, yeah. you could drive the bus up and plug it in and it has enough energy between uh, its batteries and the fuel cell and hydrogen to provide 30 hours yeah. of power at full power at 10 kilowatts, yeah. which you can do a lot, that's a lot of power. Yeah. And so, and the other advantage is, is that when you use it up, you can drive it back to the hydrogen station in 20 minutes. You can fill it up and drive with it another back. batch of hydrogen. You yeah. got another 30 hours to go back and provide yeah. your loads. And therefore, if you had several of these vehicles, you'd probably never interrupt the power. You just plug one in, unplug it, plug a new one in, go back and yeah, exactly. You know, and they can self-power the station. Like one of the one of the problems when you have a a uh, you lose all your grid power is your Dispensers don't work because they all yeah. work on, but you, in this case, you can self-power right. your, your system just using this bus. Yeah, we're actually, for the Air Force, what HCAT's doing is our, our last vehicle to be delivered, we call it SPOD, Secure Power on Demand. It has the same kind of power takeoff capability as that bus, and we're going to be demonstrating it with state civil defense here right. uh, during the next hurricane exercise, along with our two generators and our two light carts. Right. And you're, you're right, it's amazing that in, in like the size of those trailers that you have, our generator, that goes hours. I mean, tens of hours, you know, like 20, 30, 40 hours, depending on the load that's on them. Yeah. It's pretty impressive. They just keep on ticking. The light carts, we had them filled half, we had the tanks filled halfway. Those light carts, we've used them for about 15, 20 hours, and I've hardly seen any pressure drop in yeah, them, maybe exactly. 50, 60 PSI, and that's it. So that's a whole new way to leverage your investment in your public transportation is mm -hmm. in an emergency, a hurricane or whatever, you have these mobile power sources that yeah. can be used to, like we said, power up critical infrastructure. And you put a big PV array outside of that and now you don't even need an electric company to get you your power. Right. You start making your own fuel right there and delivering your own power, you know, and it's all clean. Yes. Only thing coming out your tailpipe is water vapor. Pure water, yeah. So exactly. you start off with car carbon free and you're carbon free all the way through the process. Right. And what do you need? You need water and electricity. Right. We got plenty of water. In fact, we have this 2,500 mile moat around us <laughs> that we could be pulling a lot of water out to make be making hydrogen. So right. I know that's why you and I get excited about this stuff. But Well, yeah. it provides uh, you know, additional justification. I mean, the vehicles are coming down. They're almost at a par now with diesel buses. So mm -hmm. why would you want to buy a diesel bus anymore? But yeah. when you add these additional benefits on top yeah. of it, you know, what are you going to use, your diesel bus to go and power up a critical load? I don't think so. Well, this next image here is, um, okay. the, we call it the Havel bus. So these are the buses that are going to go to Volcano National Park. Um, and they have some special equipment in them that makes them kind of unique. So what, what the audience is seeing is three of the four buses on the planet that are running on hydrogen all look like this. 
all converted by the same company, but these two buses that are going to Volcano have a piece of special gear on them. Yes, so as we all know, the Volcano at Volcano National Park, they have a lot of VOG, and if you drive your hydrogen vehicle through there, the, the sulfur compounds in that VOG would would uh, what we call kill your uh, your catalyst or your fuel cell, mm -hmm. which uh, you know is quite an expensive component. So what we decided was we we developed a uh, a uh, what I call a smart air uh, filtration system. So we have sensors uh, in front of the inlet for air and the outlet of the air after it goes through the filter. We can determine how well that filter is working and filtering out the impurities. And at a certain point, then the driver will know, oh, I've exceeded my limit, and therefore I have to uh, either return to base or just go on battery-only power. It'll, it'll automatically shut down the fuel cell so that fuel cell does not get damaged. By the and sulfur so, dioxide. By or the whatever. sulfur dioxide or hydrogen sulfide or whatever's yeah. in the air, all the nasties that yeah. could be in the air. So this uh, could be applicable, you know, not everybody has a volcano like us, but you know, you look at cities like Beijing or New Delhi, or even LA and places that have a lot of smog and a lot of uh, air pollution, this would be ideal for those uh, locations for preserving the integrity of your fuel cell power system mm -hmm. and reducing your costs. So those yeah. have been installed, developed, installed, and now we're, you know, as soon as we get our hydrogen up and running at Volcano Park, then we'll deploy the buses up there and we'll be able to run them through that kind yeah. of environment. We know that the Volcano folks intend to use those buses between their visitor center and Thurston Lava Tube because they have a real parking issue there. But every once in a while, they plan to take those buses all the way down to the shoreline. And so we, we talked to the, I went over there with US Hybrid and we talked to the operators and said, look, if you know you're gonna go down that hill, turn the fuel cell off and, don't, and let your batteries run down. Oh, sure, yeah. Because going down that hill, you've re, got regenerative braking. All the way down the hill, you're making electricity off of your, your motor. Right. It's turned into a generator, and you're coasting down the hill, and it's making electricity to charge your batteries up. That way, you can actually get to the bottom of the hill with full tanks of hydrogen and full power batteries, and all you did was go downhill. So that's right. another advantage to those buses. Um, I mean, how many vehicles can make their own power right. just by going downhill? So another advantage to the hydrogen technology and electric drive technology. Yeah, and they're really good on hills. We heard some of the battery electric buses, uh, which have their use um, um, uh, here in Hawaii, on uh, Oahu, and also on the Big Island, had trouble going up some of these long hills. Sure. They eventually the battery started to, you know, lose yeah. its uh, charge, and they started to slow down. It was like the train that said, "I think I can, I think I can." Whereas we took, remember, we did a ride and drive yep. on the Hickam bus, yep. and we charged up these hills like yep. no problem. So fully loaded. Fully loaded. Yep. We had about 20 people in them. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, so the you have that extra boost to uh, you know handle some of the big grades we have here in Hawaii. Well, Mitch, we've hit our thirty-minute point. Already? And, uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> and it goes by so fast. But um, thanks for being on with us today and giving us a look at your station and your buses, and uh, we're looking forward to that station coming online. Uh, this summer. This summer. Yeah, this summer. So, look, if you're on the Big Island, be looking for it and. Uh, and uh, if you want to find two bigger hydrogen heroes in the world, you're, you're looking at them right here. <laughs> yeah, this is right. It. We've got the tag team of hydrogen junkies right here in a while. Yeah. And uh, we thank you for joining us today. And uh, we'll have Mitch back on later when his station's up and his buses are running, and we'll get a real-time report from Maybe him. Maybe we can go over there and do hey, a Hey, that'd be great. We'll live, do a show from the Big Island. a show from the Big Island. Until then, see you next Friday. Stan Lerner, man with Cindy and Robert here in the studio, signing off. Aloha.